Good morning, church family. It's a privilege to be with you all today to worship Jesus with you. Today, we're gonna be continuing our series through the New Testament book of Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter one, beginning in verse one, or actually, rewind a little bit. We're in Revelation chapter three, beginning in verse one, and we're gonna continue that reading through verse six. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. You will not know at what hour I will come against you. You still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, thank you for the gift of your holy word. I pray that your spirit would give us eyes to see Christ. Give us ears to hear his voice. Give us hearts that respond with faith, with loving worship and obedience to your word. And Lord, as we gather for worship on this day, we are also very mindful of the suffering that our region has experienced this last week. A fire that is the largest fire in Texas history. Lord, we pray for those who mourn the loss of life, of livestock, of crops, of livelihood, for the hundreds of families that have lost their homes. Lord, would you be to them the provider and the comforter? Would you make clear the path for Many churches that are eager to help and to respond as, as our church has already responded in some ways. Lord, we pray that you would also continue to protect our region as winds rise today. Protect us from the fire, protect us from the storm. Lord, be to us our provider and our protector. And even in this moment, allow us to understand just how dependent we are upon your grace, upon your provision, upon your mercy. It is in Jesus' mighty name that I pray these things. Amen. Amen. You can have your seat this morning. In the year 1891, the British playwright and poet Oscar Wilde wrote his first and his only novel. The name of that novel is The Picture of Dorian Gray. Now, The Picture of Dorian Gray begins as a pretty simple story. A story that recounts the life of privilege and leisure of London aristocracy in the Victorian era, towards the end of the 1800s. But slowly it begins to devolve into a tale of supernatural horror. The novel's first scene depicts this up and coming artist painting a life size portrait of a wealthy young Englishman named Dorian Gray. Now, Dorian's outward appearance is almost overwhelmingly handsome. All who come in contact with him are at once enchanted with his striking looks, his youth, his polite dignity, and his personal charisma. And the painter yearns to somehow convey and translate all of this of who Dorian is into this painting. And so he pours all of his passion, all of his soul into this picture of Dorian Gray, so much so that when it is eventually completed, it is immediately recognized and regarded as his unrivaled masterpiece. Even more than capturing Dorian's appearance, this artist has somehow been able to magically capture his very essence. Before the story begins, Dorian Gray is a man characterized by spending much of his time, much of his money on helping the underprivileged by engaging in funds for social good and helping those who are essentially poor in London society. 
But then Dorian falls under the influence of this very wealthy British lord. And Dorian's a very young, impressionable young man, so he begins to hear the words of this lord who speaks to him about a new way of looking at life. Instead of using his wealth and privilege for working for the greater good, this English lord says that Dorian has the right. He has every reason to simply use his wealth and his privilege to indulge his every desire, his every craving, no matter how dark it might be, no matter how wicked it might be. And so Dorian eventually succumbs to his very worst temptations. He falls further and further into acts of cruelty, following his every whim, his every impulse. But still, Dorian's outward appearance seems pure. It seems noble. However, the true reality is a depravity and a selfishness that is turning him more and more into a hideous monster beyond rescue. Dorian can hide his true ugliness from the people who look on his outward appearance, but unbeknownst to him, this picture of Dorian Gray tells no lies. As Dorian becomes more wicked, his portrait becomes more and more hideous until this image of Dorian is no longer recognizable. The only way you could even guess it was the same painting was by the very distinctive signature of the artist. Through intrigue and murder, Dorian tries to destroy the painting because of the truth that it reveals. But in destroying the painting, Dorian ends up destroying himself. Because the monster in the frame was the true Dorian Gray. And Dorian Gray's story is a haunting reminder of the human capacity to project purity and life, all the while concealing corruption and death beneath external appearances. And so too, we must admit, it's even possible for the people of God to put on outward masks of holiness and spiritual vitality all the while being compromised with the world and compromised with sin in our hearts. You see, the book of Revelation reminds us that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, is not fooled by outward appearances. He's more than able to see and discern the true nature of our hearts. He is the one, after all, with the seven spirits of God, the one who holds the seven stars in his hands. Christ's knowledge of his people is perfect. He sees us with absolute clarity. He discerns the truth behind our pretenses. You see, the good news is that Christ loves his people too much to simply let us hide behind our masks. He won't let us project an unreality to the outside without lovingly confront us. He confronts us because he loves us. And he calls us out of the self-inflicted slavery of darkness and into the freedom of his marvelous light. And that call to freedom out of slavery, that call into the light out of darkness is at the very heart of this passage that we just read, Christ's message to the church of Sardis. And like all the messages to the churches that are recorded here in Revelation, we will see this message is just as relevant, just as real to the church of today as it was to the church 2,000 years ago. So point number one, as we journey through this text, let's talk about the city of Sardis. Archaeological studies suggest that the city of Sardis in Asia Minor was first founded over 3,500 years ago. That is a very, very long time for humans to be settled in one particular place of the earth. That means at the time that the Apostle John is pinning the book of Revelation The city of Sardis was already a deeply ancient place. Its legendary founder was the Greek hero Hercules. It's a city that is even older than the exodus of Israel from the land of Egypt. And Sardis was also a very wealthy city. It was nearby a river that had massive gold deposits. It was also surrounded by fields that were very fertile, perfect for agriculture and farmland. And so, the community of Sardis began to become very wealthy and they wanted a way to store their wealth and to protect their wealth from anyone who would want to take it away from them. And so they built for themselves this mighty citadel on top of a very steep mountain that was at the very center of their city. This citadel of Sardis was viewed as the strongest place in the ancient world. 
It was, you could almost see it as an ancient equivalent of Fort Knox in the United States, the place where the United States of America stores all of our gold reserves. This was safe. This was secure. And behind the walls of this very strong stronghold, the citizens of Sardis felt very safe. They felt very comfortable. They probably even grew in a little bit of pride. But everything changed when King Cyrus of Persia began began his conquest, his military invasion of Asia Minor around the year 547 BC. The Persian armies swept through Asia Minor like a destructive whirlwind. And initially, the city of Sardis was not going to be conquered. They were able to withstand, to hold off the invasion. The people of Sardis simply retreated into and rested behind their strong fortress walls while the Persians laid siege to the city that was below. But history tells us that there was one Persian soldier who was looking around the citadel, and he was able to discover one aspect of vulnerability, and he wanted to exploit it. And so, like a thief in the night, he and a few other men sneak inside of the city of Sardis, and they attack it from within. And immediately, at once, the mighty city of Sardis falls. Many residents of the once invulnerable city die in this attack, and many more fled for their lives, losing everything that they had in the process. Now, this is important because this event was arguably the most famous, the most feared moment in the entire history of the city of Sardis. Even centuries later, it would have been etched onto the memories of those who dwelled in this city in the same way that a New Yorker would remember the events of 9-11. And I do believe that there's a crucial connection between this historical event and Christ's message to the church of Sardis. Jesus is saying here in Revelation chapter three, I know that you think you're safe behind the wall that you have built for yourself, but you're more vulnerable than you realize. And you need to wake up to the truth before it's too late. And that leads us to our second point, which is Christ's challenge to the church of Sardis. Like the ancient people of Sardis, the church of Sardis had apparently built a wall to protect themselves. Only unlike their ancestors who fell to the armies of Persia, the Sardian church's wall was not a wall of brick and mortar. It was instead a wall of religious appearances and spiritual pretension. The Christians of Sardis knew how to look spiritual and devout. They knew how to talk the talk. They knew how to go through the motions that looked like sincere worship. And apparently they were so effective at doing this, they could even fool many people because they even had a reputation for being a church that was very alive, very vital. But Christ sees the reality of this church with perfect clarity. And he will confront them with the truth of what he sees. He says to the Christians of Sardis, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. I think this is actually one of the more haunting warnings in this portion of Revelation for Christians who live in the Bible Belt of America, don't you? Even though we live in a nation that is rapidly secularizing, the Bible Belt is still a culture where it's possible to garner some social advantage by merely appearing to be a devout Christian. If you've lived in this region and interact with the people of this region, you probably know all too well that it's possible to speak in a Christian language. It's possible to curate and cultivate for yourself a Christian image that you can project on social media and through your interactions. It's possible to place Christian symbols strategically throughout your place of work and business, all the while having a heart that is absolutely cold and dead toward God. It's possible to project an image of outward holiness, but all the while indulge in secret sins and vices in the dark. But you see, I think it would be too easy, too convenient to merely reduce this message to the Christians of Sardis as a message primarily to individuals. No, we have to remember that Christ's message is not to just individual Christians, it's to a church. It's to a congregation, an entire community of faith. Thus, we have to understand what's so haunting about this message 
is that it shows us that it's possible for churches to become environments that cultivate the pretense of Christianity rather than the practice of Christianity. It's possible for churches to become places that actively encourage hypocrisy rather than encourage holiness. And any church, any denomination, any theology that cares more about appearing Christian rather than being Christian is in desperate need of the word of Christ that is spoken to the church of Sardis. Because you see, the word of God is calling us, commanding us to work hard to push against the gravity of a culture that cares so much about external appearances. We must intentionally create a counterculture an environment of honesty and safety. We want to cultivate an environment where we are actually free to confess our sins to one another. We're able to confess our shame and our failure. And instead of receiving rejection and condemnation, we receive grace and mercy and prayer and healing. With all of my heart, I pray that Redeemer Christian Church can be such a place, don't you? place where you can find friendship and fellowship, a place that you can experience that type of safety that only the gospel of Jesus Christ can create, the safety to be truly honest, truly known, and truly loved. You see, pretend Christianity might impress some in the outside world, but pretend Christianity does not impress Jesus. In fact, Jesus hates and stands in opposition to pretend Christianity with the righteous wrath of God. Because spiritual pretending is not spiritual life. Jesus exposes it for what it really is. It is death with the appearance of life. It is the handsome Dorian Gray that conceals a horrid monster within. It is an undead zombie, an unnatural perversion of what the church is meant to be. Christ's Command for his people is to wake up from their sedation to the reality of what is at stake, to be vigilant. He calls them to remember and to keep and to hold the word of the gospel that has the power to save us and sanctify us, to fan into flame any remaining ember of true faith and sincere passion for God, to repent and turn away from hiding in the darkness and instead walk in the light before God and before one another. For the church of Sardis will not repent, the consequences will be swift and severe. Christ commands, remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come against you. He's saying to the church of Sardis, do you remember your own history? Do you remember the day when your invulnerable city fell, just like the old city that fell behind their safe citadel walls, you too, Church of Sardis, you're hiding behind your pretensions and your hypocrisy. And just like the old city once fell suddenly in the dead of night, unless you wake up and repent, your fall will be sudden and severe. And I know this is a hard word to hear, but it is, it is true to the word of God. The Bible does say that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. We need to understand something that's easy to hide from. It's not safe to hide secret sins from a God who sees everything, right? Jesus himself told us that for nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be made known and come to light. It's a very counterintuitive truth, but I need you to hear this and grasp this today. We are safest when we are walking in honest and open confession before the Lord, ourselves, and one another. I know we're afraid to go there, but that's actually where we're safest. Earlier this week, a, a group of Redeemer members met in this room. We've been meeting through the season of Lent for midday prayer on Wednesdays during the lunch hour. And I've been reading words of the penitential Psalms and we've been taking some time to meditate and contemplate these words that the Lord has given us. And this last week I read the Psalm of Psalm chapter 32. 
It's a passage that shows us two critical truths. It shows us that hidden sin destroys us from the inside out. But it also shows us that in confession, we find healing, we find forgiveness, and we encounter the steadfast love of God. The psalmist sings, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. And I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Maybe you're in this place and you've never confessed your sins to the Lord. You've never said, Jesus, I, I've messed up. I don't just like your teachings. I need you to save me. Here are my sins. I need your grace. Maybe you've never done that. Today is a day to give Christ your sins so that you can receive his grace. Maybe you've been a Christian for quite some time, but you slowly stumbled into this disconnect between what you're struggling with on the inside and what you're projecting to everyone else on the outside. Today might be the day where you need to find the healing grace that you have been hiding from way too long. Point number three, Christ's encouragement to the church of Sardis. This is a really convicting passage, but maybe for some of you, you read this passage and your emotional response is not shame or conviction. It, it's more of a sense of anger. Maybe you read Christ's word to the church of Sardis and all you can see is the church in America. All you can see is a church failing to be what it's called to be and that that's tempting you to a place of resentment because many are increasingly become more and more disgusted with the hypocrisy of the Christians and in turn becoming more and more disenchanted with the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, there's a growing number of American Christians who have left the church. They're actually de-churched, but they still believe in Jesus. Now, for many of them, to be honest with you, that's just because of the sheer busyness of American culture. People get caught up in life. They neglect the crucial importance of worship and connecting with other Christians and sitting under the teaching of God's holy word. But for others, there are those who would like to go to the church, but they have seen how the church at large has shamed the name of Jesus through public scandals and abuses of power. And I think it's important for us to, to actually acknowledge that that is the reality of our situation. We must not minimize or ignore such scandals when they happen. We must mourn and learn whatever hard lesson we can learn from such situations. But we also must not make the mistake of cynically assuming that there are no sincere Christians and that there are no healthy churches. Because even in times of darkness, even in cultures of compromise, God has always preserved for himself a faithful remnant among his people. Christ even says to the church of Sardis, yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. When I read this, I'm reminded of a story in the Old Testament of the prophet Elijah. Elijah the prophet lived in a very dark time in Israel's history. It was a time where there was a very wicked king and queen. It was actually King Ahab and Jezebel who ruled the land of Israel. Jezebel especially was seducing the nation further and further into idolatry. And for many people in Israel, they just plunged themselves into the worship of this false god Baal and they forsook the relationship with the living God. However, Elijah was not willing to compromise with his compromised culture. He spoke the word of the Lord fiercely and clearly, even when he was rejected. He stood against the false idols and the false gods of his culture, even when no one listened. He was willing to believe and defend what was right and true, even if it cost him dearly. And he was a prophet of incredible boldness and courage. But there is a moment in Elijah's story where he experiences true depression and despair. He has to run for his life because people are trying to kill him. Not because he sinned, but because he was so faithfully preaching God's word. And so he 
flees into the wilderness for refuge. He hides in the middle of the cave. And in the middle of that darkness, he becomes so aware of how very alone that he is. And he succumbs to sorrow and self-pity. He believes with all of his heart that every other faithful prophet has been murdered. And that he is utterly alone. So he prays to God sincerely, God, take my life from me. And here in his weakness and his despair and his hunger, the Lord feeds him. The Lord encounters him and he speaks to Elijah and he tells him, Elijah, there are still thousands of my people who have not bent their knee to false gods. Elijah, you're not alone. And so too, I want you to know if you at times mourn the state of the church in America, and you wonder if there are any sincere Christians out there, know too that you are not alone. Even now, there are Christians all through this nation who are faithfully serving Jesus and following Jesus and clinging to Jesus with one another. Now, they're not gonna make the news, the national news, the way the scandals do. But nevertheless, every week, They're volunteering to pack free lunches so that children of low-income families can have food to eat over the weekend. Every day, they give their time to teach English to refugees from war-torn nations. Every day, they visit the elderly in hospitals and come alongside those who are in need. They give money every month so that orphans oceans away can have food and an education. And every Sunday, they gather together and worship where unfamous but faithful pastors preach the word of God and administer sacraments. And such Christians are not perfect. You shouldn't believe that they are. They stumble, they fall, but they have committed to not hide in the darkness of sin. Instead, they've committed that when they stumble, they're gonna stumble towards Jesus together, not away from Jesus and apart from one another. So if you sincerely wanna follow Jesus, You are not alone, and you must not convince yourself that you're alone. The answer to the hypocrisy within the church is not to leave the church. The answer to the hypocrisy in the church is to faithfully be the church. Can that be something we seek together, Redeemer? Can that be something we commit to, to seek holiness and sincerity and humility? Can we commit to chasing Jesus together? In a culture that cares so much about external appearances, may we seek to be a faithful remnant of God's people. Point number four, our fourth and final point, Christ's promise to the church of Sardis. Now I'm concerned that this is kind of a heavier word. It's a heavier message. And the text is heavy. And I'm concerned that you could hear this message the wrong way and and not really hear what Christ is saying. We might hear this message and say, well, I know I need to be holy. That means I need to try harder. I need to muster all of my willpower. I need to white knuckle my way into holiness and righteousness, and then maybe God will be less mad at me. But you see, then when you inevitably fall and fail, it's so easy to give up in despair. It's so easy to actually retreat backwards into faking it. And I wanna be clear on this. Walking in holiness does take intentionality. It does require us to audit the habits of our life. It requires our effort, our agency, our practice, but we must also understand that as the prophet Isaiah told us, that even our best deeds, even our most righteous deeds are by themselves as filthy garments before the Lord. No, the righteousness that we need is not a righteousness that we can earn. It's only a righteousness that we can receive. The righteousness, the true righteousness that can withstand the justice of heaven is the perfect righteousness that we receive that by believing that Jesus is the one who came to live the perfectly righteous life we could have never lived in our own strength. That he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose in a victory for our salvation. When we believe that to be true, when we trust in Jesus, when we walk in Jesus, abide in Jesus, and unite our hearts with Jesus, we are imputed with the very righteousness of Christ. Credited, given. Now I admit that doctrine of the imputed righteousness of Christ is a big spiritual truth that is difficult for us to wrap our minds around. You see, that's where Revelation helps us. 
Revelation is a book of images. It helps us see the unseen. It helps us behold spiritual truth. And in the book of Revelation, there is a recurring image for the imputed righteousness of Christ that is given to us. And that image is a white robe. In Revelation, the white robe is a robe that symbolizes that we are holy in Christ. It's an outward display that marks God's people as perfect and pure and set apart in Christ. And to wear a white robe in eternity is to say, I belong to God. And Jesus Christ is my perfect righteousness. That's why Jesus makes the promise. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When we confess our sins to Christ, he will confess us before the court of heaven. The one who would have every right to condemn us instead stands as our advocate. The one who would judge us has become our justification. The one who can see the truth of our unworthiness clothes us in his very righteousness. So today, if you feel dirty, if you feel unclean, unworthy, one touch from him can make you clean. One word from him can make you righteous. There is this story found in John chapter eight where Jesus is in Jerusalem and some of the religious leaders come to him and they, they throw down in front of him this woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And by this point of the gospel account, Jesus has already garnered this reputation for being a friend of sinners and also being a thorn in the side of religious leaders. And so they use this woman and they use her situation to create a type of test and trap for Jesus. They bring her before Jesus and they tell him, Rabbi, this woman is a sinner. She is unclean, she's an adulteress, she's been caught in the very act of her sin. There are multiple eyewitnesses. There's no denying what she has done and the law of God demands that such a woman and such a sin deserves death. What do you say? You tell us what to do. Now, the men who ask this question already have stones in their hands. They already thirst for this woman's blood. They want Jesus to simply say the word so that they can bludgeon her to death and crush her for her sin. Or else they want Jesus to say that her sin doesn't deserve death and that they can go and run and tell everybody else that this rabbi doesn't take the law of God seriously that he denies the holy standards of God's righteous law. So it appears to be a very difficult situation. In that moment, Jesus does something that no one was expecting. He kneels down on the ground and he begins to write words in the dirt. We don't know what those words are. But when he stands up, he declares, fine. Go ahead and execute her, only let the one man who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. The crowd hears it. The mob silence. One by one, beginning with older men, all the way down to the younger men in the crowd, they begin to leave their stones in the dirt and they walk away in shame because they know their own sin. They know their own impurity. The mob quietly dissipates for each of these men know they're not worthy to throw this first stone. They're not worthy to cast judgment upon this woman. No one is, that is, except for the one man who remains. Because Jesus is the only one without sin. He's the only one who is perfectly righteous. He is the living embodiment of the perfect word of God. He is the author of the holy law. He has every right to condemn this woman and judge her, and he knows that the wages of her sin is death. But instead of casting judgment upon this woman, he speaks to her. He asks her, woman, wherever your accuser has gone, she lifts her head, she looks around, she says, Lord, there are none. He says, then neither do I accuse you. 
Now go and sin no more. Now we should ask the question, why is it possible for Jesus to let this woman go? Is it just that he's being extra nice or lenient? Does he actually want to deny or diminish the standards of God's righteous law? No. Jesus is the true and perfect judge. He knows that the wages of this woman's sin is still death. He knows that this woman deserves to be crushed according to the law of God, and that's what makes Jesus' law so amazing. It's what makes his response so beautiful. Jesus can forgive this woman of her sin because he knows that he will soon pay her penalty. For he is the one who will go to the cross where he will be pierced for our transgressions and he will be crushed for our iniquities. So too, when you are tempted to despair and weighed down by your guilt within, do not hide behind a mask of outward performance. Do not be sedated with the false security of spiritual pretense. Instead, hear the words of Christ to the church of Sardis. Wake up, repent, turn away from sin and turn towards a God who is so much better than anything that sin can give us. Come to Christ, rest in Christ, believe in Christ and be clothed in a robe of his perfect holiness. For he is your perfect and spotless righteousness, amen? Amen, let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, thank you, thank you, thank you that though our sins are many, your mercy is more. Thank you that when guilt weighs us down, that there's something so much better than just trying to hide behind a mask, that there is a freedom because we have a high priest in heaven who lives and pleads for us. He is our perfect righteousness. Lord, help us believe that. Help us live like that. Help us to have a community that defines our culture by grace and mercy and a place to walk out of darkness and into your light. So Lord, would you have mercy upon us? Would your spirit speak to us? If there's a way that you're calling us to repent, Lord, show that to us. But Lord, I pray that As we repent, I pray that we would be so much more confident in the righteousness of Christ than we are ashamed of our sin. Lord, thank you that you've died for us. Thank you that you've risen again. Thank you that for those who believe in you, those who conquer, we will one day be clothed in white. It's in Jesus' mighty name that I pray these things. Amen.